had his seven. You know Larry Barker was the last one. He was the best one preaching. Well, good morning, Saints. Good morning, <laughs> I feel like it's been a long time since I stood here. <laughs> it's been three weeks since I stood here. So, um, howdy, we've been rearranging furniture this morning. Um, Robert Lindstedt has been here. If you don't know Robert, Robert's the one that takes care of this whole organ for us. He rebuilt it. He was here while we were at camp meeting. And um, he was here, and so he had moved lots of things up here. So, um, uh, and if you wonder why I'm not wearing a robe, well, it's hot. It's already 90-something degrees this early, this early in the morning, and I'm not going to wear a robe today. So we'll see if lightning strikes. Camp meeting was another huge success. Everything went as well as possibly uh, could be expected, uh, except for the extreme heat ran a lot of people off early in the week. Um, as of, I think a lot of people had already planned to leave because it was Sunday and work happened on Monday, but uh, a lot of people, especially older people, uh, left Sunday afternoon. It was just too hot up there. Um, so, it has been hot, it has been dry, it's, we've seen a couple of little rains, uh, but please be in prayer for more and more and more rain. Um, also, we want to be in prayer for the people of Maui and of Cedar Park, Texas. Um, that fire in Maui is a thing that doesn't happen, a fire on an island. Uh, and I think I read this morning they are up to 96 deaths in that fire, which makes it the deadliest wildland fire in uh, 100 years uh, in, in America. So, Cedar Park also got on fire. Uh, I don't know that they've had any fatalities yet, but um, they lost multiple uh, apartment complexes and townhouses and that sort of thing. I don't know how many people have been displaced, but there were 70 to 7,000 that were, that were threatened at that point. So um, that last I heard about Cedar Park was probably Wednesday. So um, I, have, I have failed to look it up, but um, that's that. That's what I know what y'all know. Uh, my dad celebrated his 94th birthday yesterday. Alvin is 94. <laughs> Alvin, I hope you watch this today. Happy birthday, my friend. We missed him at camp meeting this year. Thankful but, for being in my home. Thankful for the Cummings have moved out of their trailer, <laughs> their little camper trailer, and moved into their big old house at Olympia Crossing. Um, how long did y'all live in that thing? A year and nine months. Oh. A year, nine months, three days, and 27 hours. Right? And they're, still, they're still married. They're still married, <laughs> amazingly. The end somehow managed not to kill Keith. It's amazing. So, uh, they are in their home finally, and that's the place we've got. That's his brother's home from the hospital and doing better. He's on vacation, just celebrated his 54th birthday. 54th birthday, so. Hey, a new grandies. A new grandies? For Father's Day. Her name is Willow Day. Uh, cousin Joe lives in Maui, uh, and he has lost everything he owned. Now, the interesting thing about Joe is I never knew Joe existed. And so she said, hey, he lost everything. And I went, Joe who? So um, we've only been married for like 28 and a half years. Why in the heck would I know anything about her first cousin Joe? So <laughs> I've met his siblings, but not him. So that's interesting. Um, I guess because he lives in Maui. 
there, the house she grew up in <coughs> So, lots to celebrate, um, lots to be in prayer over. Anything else in point? Let's worship God. And I'm assuming, lack of black box, we're doing our code. Sure. Lack of black box, lack of Stephen, we're doing without that, so. So, friendly, join me in the response to call of worship. Oh, by the way, those of you at home, Welcome back. We are back, and bulletins and hymns are on the website again. So thanks to Carol. Uh, that's all been done. And well, I did the website part, but she did the work of hard work. So join me in the response of call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Sing to God. Tell a lot of wonderful words. Remember all the things God has done. We glory in God's holy name. Seek the Lord, our strength and refuge. We come to be in God's presence. Good and gracious and almighty God, as we gather, we give you thanks and honor and praise and glory for giving us the opportunity to come here and worship your holy name. We give you thanks that we do so in a nation where we can do it without retribution. And so we ask that in this hour, you might silence in us any voice but your own. Help us to hear and see and know only you that as we go from this place, we might be refreshed and renewed and prepared to carry your love and your grace out into the world. For we pray in Jesus' holy name, and that all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
friends, the truth of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we come into this place, we come knowing we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, through the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. And so in response to the grace we've already received, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Holy God, it's easy to confess with our lips and the Lord, but it's much harder to believe with our hearts, to live in a way that puts you first. We are quick to trust in idols. We depend on what we can see, touch, and control, instead of waiting to hear your still small voice. Forgive us, Lord. And help our unbelief, so that we confess our lips, we may truly believe in our hearts. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. In the position to condemn us, it is Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lived for us, who died for us, who reigns in power for us, who prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to Lord will give what is good, 
in our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. So I'm reminded of two things. One is Carol keeps having to read because we don't have anybody else signed up. So Cecil was going to pass that calendar around. If y'all could sign up for August and September, that would be great. The second was the second thing was uh, a psalm reading, uh, and I was reminded uh, yesterday. Cecil and I and Jeremy were catching up. We're all Jeopardy nuts. We love to watch Jeopardy, um, and. Among the many things, among the many questions, you know, Jeopardy people know a little bit of everything, uh, was uh, they were supposed to name the book from which this quote came. Uh, and the quote was, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And none of the three of the contestants on Jeopardy got the songs. Isn't that what? Isn't that, that was really sad. It was like, it's son, everybody knows that's Psalm 23, but they couldn't even get songs. That was, of course, you know, we were sitting in our living room without bright light shining on us and a camera and thousands of dollars in play, but still, it's Psalm 23. Anyway, there, there was that story. Our gospel reading, however, is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Derive to me, please, in honor of the reading of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately, Make disciples, get into the boat, and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. They cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not fear, do not be afraid. Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Friends in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So, friends, big surprise. I'm a desert rat. Big surprise, right? Don't get me wrong, I love the water. I love to swim. I wish, in fact, that I could swim for exercise, as I used to do. It's easier on the joints than other things. And uh, when we lived in Big Springs some 16 plus years ago, uh, I would get up at 4.30 every morning. I would go down to the YMCA uh, and swim a mile every day. And then go home and shower and be ready to go by the time it was time to get who were at the time. Uh, very small toddler twins. Um, there is no YMCA, believe it or not, in the spring. There is no Olympic size spring for Davis. Um, that, that no Olympic size pool for me to go and do that, so not happening. But if I'm honest, as much as I love the water, as much as I love to swim, if I'm in the water where I cannot see what's in the water with me, it tends to freak me out. <laughs> I don't do well. Most of the rivers and lakes in Texas are filled with brown, murky water. The Gulf of Mexico is filled with brown, murky water. And when I feel things like seaweed touching my body under the water, I don't know what kind of monster that is. I can't see or hear what it is, and I want back in the boat. Out here we have cacti and rattlesnakes and mountain lions and javelinas and even the occasional bear and all of the kinds of things that can hurt you, but you know what? I can see them and I can hear them. I can know what the potential threat is and take appropriate action to protect myself. 
As you know, just before camp meeting, we took the first vacation we had taken in five years, which is still advised. It is unhealthy. Don't ever take that long without giving yourself a break. Stessa had rightfully uh, surprised us by booking a cruise to the Caribbean, and as part of that, we spent a day in Grand Cayman snorkeling, where the water is clear. You can see what's there, and I absolutely love that. One of my, the favorite, one of my favorite pastimes, the thing that relaxes me the most, is to be waist deep in a cold, clear step trout stream with a fly rod in my hand because I can see clearly what it is that I need to see around me, and I know that there's nothing to fear. Also, as a side note, my grandfather is standing right here anytime I'm fly fishing, so that's a connection I have with him. Put me in the water where I can see clearly, and I'm great. Put me in the water where I can't see clearly, and I'm terrified. Or maybe not terrified, but I'm at least uncomfortable. Terrified would be what my paternal grandfather described to me as he spent all of World War II in the Pacific Ocean. And when he described storms in the Pacific, he described it as if Sleeping Lion Mountain were rolling toward him. Now, if you're at home and this is your first time visiting us, Sleeping Lion Mountain, find a picture of this church. It's the cliff face that's right next to our church on the north side over here. It's comparatively huge. That's terror. And I suspect that terror would be exaggerated by people seeking to kill him. As he was in the Pacific in World War II, people were trying to kill him continuously with torpedoes and bombs dropped from planes with red dots on them. That's terror. Peter and the rest of the disciples are in the same boat, so to speak. They have just had the biggest party you've ever seen. This story is preceded by uh, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000 people. And Jesus has sent the disciples away to get on the boat and go ahead and cross the Sea of Galilee, and he'll meet them later while he stays and dismisses the crowd. And he's gone off by himself on a mountain to pray, and the disciples find themselves hacking against the wind in rough water. Now what I know about sailing, you could fit in a thimble. But I did do one week of sail school in Holland as a group building project among exchange students when I was 18 years old. So only three and a half decades ago. And I do know that if you're sailing against the wind, the only way to move is to tack. You have to cross at angles. So if I want to get to that window back there, the very back of the church, I first have to go to that window, and to that window, and to that window, and then I can aim at my decoration. I have to zigzag back and forth if I'm tacking against that so if I'm sailing against the wind, and that's called tacking. The boat leans when you're doing that. We actually flipped one over during that sail school. A hilarious story for another day. Imagine doing all that with waves the size of Sleeping Lion Mountain rolling at you, and it's dark early in the morning and you can't see. I cannot imagine the extent to which these disciples are terrified for their lives. And I cannot imagine that it helped in the midst of all that to see some dude walking out across the water. Even without a modern understanding of gravity, the disciples knew that people tend to sink in water. That's something we all tend to learn at a pretty early age. So they think he's a ghost at first, which I would imagine added to the fear a little bit more because a ghost is all you need at a time like this, right? But Jesus immediately calms their fears with two little words. Ego amin in Greek. 
In RSV that we read this morning, we read uh, that Jesus is quoting, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. But the Greek is, reads a little something more like, Take heart, I am, stop being afraid. They're already afraid. Jesus tells them to knock it off. But in the midst of that, it's him identifying himself in which we find the most comfort. Remember that Matthew's audience, is, Matthew is writing to Jewish converts to Christianity. And when we read the words in Greek, ego eimi, it is more clearly translated into Hebrew as Yahweh. I am. The name that God gave to Moses in Genesis. I am. It's the word the Hebrew people would never actually pronounce. If you're reading along uh, in Hebrew and you come across the word Yahweh, they would never say that word. They would read Adonai as opposed to Yahweh. They would see Yahweh, but read Adonai, the Lord, out of respect to the greatness of God. You never say his name. And that's the name Jesus is using when he says, Ego, me. I am, he says. Stop being afraid. Now, there's one other thing going on here. As we, as a Jewish, a Jewish audience, remember we're a Jewish, a Jewish audience as we read this. One of the many stories that would always weigh heavily on our minds comes from the wisdom literature in the book of Job. Job, towards the end of the book, continues to question God about his own suffering. And God asks if Job ever went to the springs of the sea or walked to the recesses of the deep. That's Job 38.16, as read, translated into English, from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Right, so we've got Hebrew translated into Greek, and then for you, I translated it into English. Have you ever went upon the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? And what we read in Matthew 14, 25, in the Greek is more accurately translated, Jesus went to them walking upon the sea. And earlier in Job 8, he claims that God had traversed the oceans before the creation of humanity, saying that God stretched out the heavens and trampled on the waves of the sea. Jesus walking on the water in our Jewish minds is a clear sign to those of Hebrew origins that God has given Jesus over all, God has given Jesus authority over all the created world which becomes even more apparent to us when Jesus takes Peter's hand and the seas and the winds are suddenly calmed. And then, of course, there is a, the admission, truly, you are the Son of God. So, of course, we will be reminded upon Jesus' death when the world, the world goes dark in Matthew 27 54, when we hear the echo of the centurion and his friends. Truly, this was the Son of God. It's pretty easy for us to focus on Peter, ever the impulsive one, who is the first to want to bail off the boat into the water and walk out across the water to Jesus. But he's also the first to get distracted by the winds and the sea and the waves and begin to sink. One fun little note here while we're talking about languages is that Peter, who we'll remember, was first called Simon, right? Peter was then renamed by Jesus Petros, which means the rock. And he said, you are the cornerstone, the rock on which I will build my church. Remember that? Well, when Peter loses his focus on Jesus, he sings like a rock. Little pun that has nothing to do with the Bible, it just <laughs> it works. Super easy for us to think about ourselves in the story with Peter, which it is, to 
to some extent about Peter. It's mostly about Jesus and his whole lordship of Jesus. But it's easy to see ourselves in Peter's shoes because we so often lose our focus because there are winds and waves and lives in life of which to be afraid. There's more than enough in life to give us anxiety and cause us to lose our focus on Jesus, and it's hard for us to see clearly in the murky waters of life because there's enough within the context of our lives which cause us to lose that focus. Maybe it's raising kids, which can really cause stress in a life. I can clearly remember Jerry Hilton many years ago speaking to the congregation at camp meeting as he taught the morning Bible study. He reminded us that it was incumbent upon retired folks to remind young parents that it's going to be all right. And I can say with some confidence that I do remember the stresses of raising young children. Even though we still have some work to be done in raising our children, we're almost there. But looking back on raising them when they were little, Yes, there were stresses, but all I, mostly what I remember is the joy. The fun times that we had. Maybe it's finances that give us stress. Or the worry that retirement funds will run dry before we run out of life. For some, it's health that causes us stress. I mean, our own health or the health of a loved one when someone is struck with a difficult diagnosis. For those who are still working, work can cause anxiety, especially in the face of an unaccommodating boss or supervisor. Maybe it's school. As adults, it's easy for us to forget the complications of navigating the unseen in junior high and high school. But as adults, it's our responsibility that to remember that those things which ultimately don't matter much in the long run are real and tangible expressions of authentic anxiety for those students who are treading difficult waters of popularity and studies and sports and UIL and college applications and just learning to live in a pubescent body. All those things are real and so much more that I'm sure I'm not even thinking about. Ultimately, we all live through those things and discover that life is about a lot more than that. But for now, it's dark. And it's a dark and scary whirlpool in which young folks find their reality. And it's in our compassion that they might find the hand of Christ reaching out to them in the storm. Now, I have admitted here probably thousands of of possibilities of things that can give us anxiety. I'm limited not only by time, but also by my imagination. Stress is real. Anxiety is as palpable as anything we can hold in our fallible hands. There are plenty of objects and situations in which uh, life can bring about apprehension no matter what our age is. There are strong headwinds and waves so large we pale in comparison as if Sleeping Lion Mountain were rolling toward us. There are things that lurk below the surface of the murky waters of life that we simply cannot see or imagine but are no less tangible and give us fear. In the midst of all those things, fear is, in fact, the appropriate response. Stress is the appropriate response because life is full of enough things to frighten us. And to say that we don't have fear because we have Jesus is, frankly, a lie. But what we can say is that those things that cause us fear and anxiety and stress do not have the last word. And we don't ever get over that fear, ever. But we do get through it. If we just look up from the storm and behold Jesus 
reaching up his hand. Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who reaches out to get his hand to us in the midst of our anxieties and our fears, and who calls us to focus on him that we might stay afloat. And so we ask once again that you would help us in the midst of our own fears, in the midst of our own anxieties to picture your Son, our Lord Jesus, holding out his hand to us and calming the winds and laying down the waves and waiting to pull us safely, safely into the boat. For it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Stand so we we'll believe using the Apostles' Creed as a friend in the Lord. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sit upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge his quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Christ. Amen.
They have celebrated birthdays this week. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for 94 years of Alvin and his wisdom and his grace and his humor. We give you thanks for a new birth, for Nancy's great niece, for the beauty of life that you've given us, and for the joy that we experience the youth. We pray for those who are coming towards the end of their lives and are struggling with what to do with life and families are struggling what to do what is right. So we pray for Jenny. We pray especially today for Catherine Hardy as she learns to live anew in the assisted living facility. We pray for Scott and Janet and a whole list of Larrys if they have faced difficult health problems of late. For Virgil, as his heart continues to tick and his body continues to strengthen, we give you thanks. For Don and Susan and Charleston and April and Ian and Yolanda and Michelle and so many others who suffer cancer. We lift them up to you, O oh God, and ask that you would heal them, make them whole, be with the doctors and nurses who treat them, give them wisdom and compassion, but be also with those who seek the cure, who look through microscopes and at data and through drugs and pray for their success that we might stop fearing this disease. We pray for Alvin and Catherine, for Pat and Jean and Marjorie and Emily and so many others that are just growing a little older. Help us to remember every day that they need to be reminded that they're loved. Help us to remember every day that we need their wisdom. Pray for Caleb and all the violence that he represents for us. As we lift up his healing to you, we pray that we might find some peace in this nation, that we might find some way to combat the ever-growing amount of gun violence we see every day. We pray for Rudy, for Allison as they learn every day knew what it means to live with ALS. We give you thanks that faith has grown into a strong, loving young lady who can serve tea and water at the Miller camp. For A.B. as she grows strong and for Trent as miracles continue to be apparent in his life, help us, oh God, to see those miracles see you in them. These things and so many others we lift up to you as we pray together the prayer of Lord Jesus Christ taught all of his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's return to God a small portion of the great many gifts He's given to us.
God, we lift these gifts up to you, giving you thanks and honor and praise and glory, for you are our God. You created us to be your people, and you've given us these gifts. Like you did with the loaves and fish and fed the 5,000 on the side of that lake that day, we ask that you multiply these gifts, that we might continue your work and share your love and your grace with everyone when we meet, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For we pray in his holy name. Oh, I've done already. Nice. Uh, <laughs> 